Hey everybody, Scott Tower here. I'm back with another Tuesday live stream. I had pondered not doing one today. I just came back from Atlanta and I thought, well, you know, maybe give myself a day to kind of catch up on stuff. And then I thought, you know, I'm just going to be working on some of these images that I want to work on anyway. So why not jump on here and do a live stream? Uh, so if you're not familiar with the channel, basically I'm working in Capture One. We're going to start there. We're going to go to Photoshop. We're going to do some heavy lifting in there and then we're going to return to Capture One. Uh, for the finishing touches. Now, a lot of the uh, things we're going to do here, you could easily uh, replicate, replicate in uh, Lightroom, but uh, I prefer Capture One for a lot of things like color grading and just the way it handles the raws. But uh, that's the uh, that's about how it rolls. And I wanted to do something a little bit different today than what I typically do. Uh, so normally I just kind of you know walk through my steps and do the same thing. And a lot of people are like, well, you know, I get your process now, like I understand it, and the creative aspect of this, you know, is is more interesting. But some images like this one, this beautiful woman, uh, I want to redo, redo this or retouch this picture for her and make it everything it can be. Uh, but at the same point, um, I don't know if that conversation is going to be the most lively. So what I wanted to do was kind of talk about some of the things that are going on today in the photography world. And uh, so get some commentary going and, and a little bit of banter as I'm working on this. And of course, if you have questions while I'm retouching, you know, feel free to throw those out there. I will still talk about what I'm doing as I'm working on it, but uh, I kind of wanted to make that uh, make that distinction because I think it's kind of interesting as we do these every week that a lot of you are getting down the process that I use and you're like, well, you know, okay, um, I don't want to make the channel into something boring and repetitive, uh, but at the same point, I want it to be educational and at least, uh, you know, in areas where I feel that I have some knowledge to pass on. Uh, otherwise, yeah, it's just guessing, which, you know, you can watch any channel for that. Uh, so I'm doing here is I'm just going to crop this real quick so that it's a little... Uh, she's filling the frame and and not so uh, not so small. Hey, Robin, welcome to the stream. Nice to see you in here. That's uh, you're a new face in here. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna work on this, and uh, I'll start kind of talking about what I'm gonna do here. I'm I like the exposure. I think it's a bit bright, um, and I always expose again as far to the right as I can, uh, because remember this is half of your image data right here. So even underexposing by one stop uh, will cost you later on. So. You, if you are tend to expose skin a little bit low because uh, you want it to look good in the back of the camera, you are doing yourself a disservice. So you can see here the histogram comes right in and parks itself right next to this edge. That is perfect. And then I want to go ahead and lower the exposure. You can always lower the exposure, but you really can't raise it because by definition, that's adding a memory you didn't have. What I'm trying to do is get her skin to be right around this line here and uh, see what we can do. He took a lunch break. <laughs> there you are. Well, welcome. Uh, so I'm just lowering the exposure a bit on her skin uh, where I want it. And then I'm going to play with everything else. So we can bring the shadow back up a bit. And the blacks are actually my bigger problem in here. I want to see this, the red uh, burgundy there. And all these are small movements. Note that we, we have a pretty aggressive uh, lowering of exposure here. But again, that's because we wanted to capture all the data, which means these shadows are really clean uh, because that uh, this big lump of data would have fallen off the edge of the graph had we exposed it the way the camera wanted it to be. So that was uh, that was my, my shot there. And you can hold on your alt key if you want to move this uh, minorly, if you're, you know, get your uh, OCD and you can do this via even 0.7. And uh, I'm just looking at her skin exposure here. Again, a bit bright. I'm going to bring the highlight down just a, just a skosh, as we say here in Wisconsin. And maybe fiddle with these just a bit. That's better. That's good. Now this is what I'm going to do uh, when we go into Photoshop. Uh, we're going to then do all of our color, color grading and stuff when we come back from all that because color grading is one of those things I find very subjective and it might say, well, you know, I'd really like uh, this to be a little more blue. I don't know if you saw the live stream I posted last week uh, where I did one uh, that was a Maleficent and I did a blue one and a sepia one and I was really torn on which one I liked because we did both of them here, but it was really nice to be able to, alt to offer that at the end of the the process and still be able to choose one the other or both without having to retouch the skin twice so what i'm going to do is uh, we got that done i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to give this a description so that's uh i'm going to say this is emma and what color is this this is uh pink purple we'll call it pink that's right and then I want to make sure that her name is in the job identifier. So this is one of my little tricks for Capture One is everybody gets a job identifier and that's the person. And then when I go ahead and run my processes at the end, it will put it in the right Dropbox folder no matter what picture I'm looking at it. So I could have 50 pictures 
by 50 different people of 50 different people selected, press the process button and they'll all get dropped into the right Dropbox. Um, the only thing this description does is put it in front of this name here because this is meaningless to me and I want a little bit more like, what is that a picture of in case I don't see the preview. Uh, so this looks wonderful. I am very happy with it. I have the white balance where I want it. I have my shadows appropriate and I'm just gonna go ahead and make sure no other checkboxes are checked and click process. And that should open up Photoshop, of course. So today I thought I'd talk about not only just the retouching as we're doing this here, but let's talk about NFTs. So if you're not familiar with non-fungible tokens, you're about to be. Uh, this is a craze that is uh, started well, actually a few years ago uh, where you take uh, imagery and you could put it onto the same blockchain uh, that say you find Bitcoin and, and Ethereum and other things like that. And it allows you to basically make a one of version of an image. And that, uh, that image is just like an original print and can be worth as much as an original print. So if you think about how many pieces of art you've seen, I'll say the uh, really good example I like to use is the original Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali photo where he's standing over Frazier, I think he's on the floor. And it's that black and white, it's an iconic photo. What if you could own the original of that? Not the print, but an, the actual original photo. What would that be worth to you? And that's the idea behind an NFT is an NFT stands for a non-fungible token. And non, non-fungible is a fancy way of saying that it can't be exchanged for something uh, that's the same, that can be considered the same thing. It's a standalone version. Uh, let's, let's use uh, quarters as an example. So say you have a pocket full of quarters and I say to you, hey, uh, can I give you my quarters and you give me your quarters? And you'd be like, well, sure. I mean, why not? That's just a quarter and they're all the same. So we'd swap quarters and everybody would be happy. But let's make it more complicated. Let's say that you are a um, currency uh, collector and you notice that one of my quarters is got a misminting stamp on it. Let's say it's been double stamped or it's crooked or there's other something else going on. And all of a sudden that quarter is worth a lot of money. Now to that person, that is not a fungible thing. It is non-fungible. You can't be, you can't just give me a regular quarter and we call it even. That quarter is you know, uh, its own thing. It's its own little snowflake. And you can't uh, you can't just say, hey, I'm going to swap that for that. That's the idea behind an NFT is that you would create digital copies or digital versions of these that are not say copies, but digital versions of these that are minted. And what I mean by minted is they're taken, the image is encrypted, the description of the, the image is, is uh, encrypted, the title is encrypted, and then the owner of the image, which would initially be you, of course, or uh, whoever it may be. And then you would then put that into the blockchain for Ethereum is the um, digital coin that we're using for this kind of stuff. And that basically means that uh, that the world then recognizes that this this piece of art is an original one of or you know set of, uh, say, three or whatever, how, just like you would do with, with prints. And you'd release it out there, and then people buy it. And that's what happened to Beeple at uh, that, uh, that auction at Christie's last week, uh, where was it last, might have been last week, uh, where he sold that what, $69 million uh, GIF, effectively, or JPEG, uh, that he had been working on for a few years. Basically, a snapshot of all of his work, and that person bought that for $69 million at auction. And the, actual, the guy who got the uh, won the winning bid said that he would have paid a lot more for it had he had the option to. So now that doesn't mean, by the way, that the copyright of that image then belongs to the owner. It's just that one, that specifically that one JPEG. I mean, there's no duplicates of it. It's the one that is minted. It's the one that there is. So if I give him another JPEG or he gives you a JPEG and it's not that one, you don't own that one. Like That's what it is. The cool thing that this does for us is it allows us to open the door to selling a different kind of digital product. Uh, maybe not something our clients would purchase. Um, they may, but uh, where it gets difficult is the minting part where I talked about you take and you encrypt it and you put it on the blockchain. Uh, that part actually costs money and that's called uh, gas in the Ethereum universe. And the price of gas fluctuates violently giving, during the day. I actually have a tracker on my machine that tells me the price of gas. And when it gets low enough, which is usually Sunday, uh, early in the morning or late, very early, late at night, uh, you can get the gas price down to maybe 30 or $40. Uh, and now 
a few months ago, that, that would have been an outrageous sum to pay for gas. Uh, but you know, I've seen it as high as $250 now in the peak of the day. And basically that means that there's a number of people who are requesting that things be minted. And the people who are doing the minting, those are the, the miners, the people running mining applications, uh, all have an agreement on how much they're going to get paid for their effort. And uh, that is kind of like a bid, an auction kind of thing. We say, well, I'm willing to pay, you know, two dollars for gas nobody's going to bother to pick that up so it'll just be stuck pending forever so usually people just use market value and and let it roll and that's the way it works so if you were going to do this for customers you would be facing a situation where you would have to pay gas to mint each image that the customer may want now it may be that that's part of your business model like hey i love this idea and yes the client is willing to pay two hundred dollars to have an original jpeg it's the only one you know it's the minted one uh, that's uh, that's a thing. You know, it could possibly be a thing. Uh, I just put one up today on on my my foundation page. I'm not going to put a link to it or anything. I just want to talk about it today. Uh, where I have a picture of um, Brooke Hadlin's room from uh, the Shawshank Redemption, and I, it's an original photograph I took many years ago. It's the movie set, and it's actually inside the prison. And I took the picture, and you can see the you can see the chair, and you can see the uh, the writing that they put on the on the the ceiling, you know, both him in red. And I thought it was a kind of a cool picture. I'm like, this would be a great, I think a great collectible uh, for someone who's looking for photography. I noticed that a lot of NFTs are animated GIFs and there are a lot of them. And I just, to, for life me, I don't see the value in, in that. It just doesn't, it doesn't appeal to me as a person. So I haven't really looked far than there, but there've been a couple of regular images that I've liked quite a bit, um, that I have a few artists that I've liked over the years. and. They're putting some of these out now. And I'm like, hmm, this might be an interesting an interesting purchase because you have to look at it like art as well. Um, for example, if you were to purchase one of my images and then you turn around and someone says, oh my God, I love that. I want to buy that from you. It's yours to sell at that point because you own that one and you could turn around and sell it. And now you can also do some very interesting things when these things are minted. As you can say, every time that's sold, I'm going to keep a percentage of it and uh, then it gets to an interesting thing because right now the galleries that carry my work for example would sell one of my pieces and I would you know know who's, who bought it because I want to you know, send that person a certificate and, and all that jazz and I kind of do the same thing with the NFTs if someone buys one of mine you know they've bought an original image it's not a print it's an original and I want to treat it the same way so if I do that and then that person turns around and decides to sell that image to someone else which is well within their right, which again, I've had happen on at physical galleries. A physical gallery will buy one of my pieces in another gallery. Uh, oddly, there's a gallery down the street <laughs> that tends to buy the gallery, buy the stuff right from the gallery uh, the day of or the day after my showing, which I thought was pretty cool. I'm like, why don't you guys just host me, right? Uh, but they don't. They just buy a couple pieces every year and then they turn around and they put those in their gallery and sell them. Uh, but I don't know who those new like if they sell a piece, I don't have a relationship with that gallery. Um, so those those owners are people that I may or may not know. And I may, you know, I do my best to track them down. And oftentimes I have a lot of success. But uh, the other thing is that I don't get any additional revenue. So if that gallery buys the piece for, say, $1,500 and then turns around and, and sells it for $2,500, I get nothing from that. The gallery keeps all of it. And that's, that's fine. I mean, that's one of the goals behind collecting art. You want to buy the art and then you want the art to go up. And then you want to turn around and you want to sell it. And uh, I've seen a lot of that with the NFTs. In fact, the guys who, who bought that, that Beeple piece have said that they already have, have talked to some people about flipping that. So they may indeed turn around and make money from that. Uh, Beeple himself you know, could continue to make other NFTs uh, from uh, similar images, uh, his you know, smaller subsets of them, because again, it's, it's his right to do so. But again, you don't want to spoil the, uh, the pot by creating duplicates uh, for example, if I sell you a print, say I, I get down with a shot of Emma here and, and it's beautiful and you say, well, um, I really loved it and I want you to make another one for me. And I say, well, I've already sold that. I, I made one 16 by 24 metal print, which is what I love to print a lot of the stuff on. Not not boudoir, but in general, a lot of my body paints are on metal. This would probably be like a nice watercolor paper. Uh, then you would turn around and say, well, can you just make another one of those for me? And I could. But if I do that, I've kind of invalidated really the person who said, well, I, I want the only one of those that exist. And uh, then I turn around and I give you one, then that's uh, that becomes a problem. 
So you have to be kind of careful in the fine art world. And years ago, uh, and I don't know if you know who Brooke Shaden is, but Brooke Shaden is a, a friend of mine. And we had spoken on a couple different occasions. And on one, I told her that I used to destroy my uh, TIFF images when I was done. I'd, I'd print the image 10 times and then destroy the TIFF. And I did that because it, it makes sure that no one can say, well, you printed more of those after you were done. And she basically told me I was nuts. She's like, you don't have to do that. You don't have to go that far. You just have to be sure that you never break that that sacred right with, you know, the fine art world because that you can't you can't undo that. You know, once you do that, you kind of screwed yourself. Uh, so that was uh, eye opening. And I ended up in a situation where I, I needed the original again because the lab I'd used for printing at the time actually uh, printed them on bad backers and they all peeled off. Um, needless to say, I don't use that lab anymore. I'm not going to say who that lab is, but they're a big one and uh, not one that sponsors this channel ever because that's not going to happen. But uh, that was a very learning, a very uh, deep learning experience for me back then. And I thought that was uh, interesting. Now, the the whole NFT thing uh, is a little bit different because you can, again, continue to make you know originals or you know minted versions. But every time you do that, you kind of say, hey, this is a, uh, a one of, say, three images, and you keep it that way. Uh, you kind of have to do the same thing. So when you mint it, you're going to say how many you intend to make. Uh, you have to be very vocal about that. And mine says very clearly one of one. And I think that's uh, that's the way that you know it should be kept. And uh, using the blockchain to make sure those things don't get um, don't get wrecked is, is ideal. Um, thank you for the thank you for the the uh, kind words there. Yeah, I I'm trying to do some some different stuff, and you know, there's a lot of Photoshop channels out there, and I I think there are a lot of really good Photoshop channels out there. But I think a lot of them are also just tips and tricks. And you're like, okay, well, I'm never going to use that. And then when you need it, you're never going to remember where you saw it. And I'd say I'd just rather show you the entire workflow from start to finish. If you have questions on what I'm doing, by the way, this is just my frequency separation. This action is available for free. Just grab it in the description below and uh, go uh, give me a like if you like it. That's, that's, uh, that's the internet way of clapping. If you like this video too, and you've been here for a while and you've watched this, click like. I'm just frequency separating this a bit aggressively actually but um it's because i'm chatting and i don't normally talk to people while i'm working so this is new for me right <laughs> so i'm just doing here is is working on some of the skin that i want to fix a little bit i don't want to make her uh, overly fake she's just beautiful absolutely stunning woman and uh, actually we're going to shoot her this sunday again so looking forward to that super fun super fun girl uh, but we, we've got a couple areas that I want to fix, and I'm going to use a bunch of different techniques to do that, and I thought I'd just do it live. Because, uh, you know, hey, why not? Yes, every every one of these is different. Everyone is different. Yeah, we all get, we all have different things to teach. Uh, my friend Gary, uh, we go to a lot of conventions together, and, and he'll be, uh, he speaks at a lot of stuff as well. And he says, you know, if there's one thing you can learn, you can learn one thing from everybody that you watch, even if it's how not to give a presentation. I was like, well, that's a really, <laughs> that's a really insightful uh, bit of wisdom there. Okay, that looks great. So that's basically the majority of her skin there. So uh, before and after, that didn't take me too long. Uh, but I do want to do uh, kind of a finishing pass on this. And I don't want to make it look too fake because she's got good skin, you know, that's good skin and just gorgeous woman. Uh, I'm going to use a, um, a dodge and burn, a bunch of layers that just, they're just um, blank, but it helps me because I don't have to sit there and make these things over and over again. So it's just a curve this way and a curve this way for lightening and darkening areas and the masks. And then two layers we'll play with in a bit. This is actually her eyes. And uh, this one's a on global. And that's basically it. Uh, but in order to see this, I use an eye help, which again is another series of layers. All these are available, by the way, in my store. So I just throw them down here. You don't need them. I'm not saying go buy them because they're not they're not really that special. Um, I've even shown you guys how to make them. This is just a gray layer, um, solid fill layer set to color. And that gives us a pure black and white. And this is, by the way, the only way to get a pure black and white in Photoshop. Any other method uh, relies on the engine. And there are two different engines. And if you don't use one engine and you use, say, curves for correction, for example, things will go sideways. So this is this is a really safe way to do it. Uh, so it's just solid color, gray layer set to color. And then I have another layer here, it's just a curve and it's an aggressive curve. And the idea here is to make your skin as blotchy as possible. Uh, so if I'm gonna do that, 
Um, this will help me see any areas that need dodging and burning. And again, I'm being overly aggressive here because if we're mean to her skin here, when we get rid of this, um, everything will be a lot easier to look at. Okay, so we're gonna do a 1% flow soft brush. And I'm just gonna bring up the areas that are a little bit darker than their, their surrounding friends. Um, and if you look, uh, what we're making is very, very subtle. Uh, but this will all add up. So just kind of making a, a few little marks here to bring up this area slightly. And uh, any other little things that kind of jump out. Basically, I'm just letting my eye wander and anything I see that's a little dark, I'm just going to bring it up by adding that little bit of curve by letting it see through this. That's what we're drawing so far. See through this uh, mask. Anyway, so I see a lot of those uh, NFTs being posted now and a lot of people from the, the 3D realm, you know, the people who make a lot of 3D stuff are all jumping on board. And there's a lot of beautiful art in there. There's also a little, you know, a lot of disturbing animation, which is not really my thing. Uh, but everyone seems to think that's what you need to get the money right now. And some of these are selling for great prices, really outrageous prices. And uh, maybe they're not outrageous because um, people like that art, but to me, I just, I don't understand it. But like like most people, there's art you enjoy, enjoy and art you're like, what is that? You know, that that happens in NFTs as well. And, and I'm, I'm experiencing that as well. Some of this 3D art I'm looking at, and I go, I really appreciate this. And some of it I look at it, I go, okay, that, that's just giving me a headache looking at it. And uh, then there's some that is is quite old. There's uh, some that were minted in like 2007, 2008, as far as you know, uh, age of kind of digital currencies go. That's that's pretty early on in the process. And and some of those are rising up now to be uh, worth quite a bit of money. You know, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars each. And I see those kind of changing hands. People are buying them and then turning around and selling them again. So I think right now you're seeing what's kind of an interesting revival in the whole NFT um, uh, marketplace for that. <laughs> Robin says she uses my black and white trick. Isn't it handy? It's like, it it's so life-changing. And if you try and use the other method, you end up with these strange marks all over the place. I remember arguing with that for the longest time, not understanding what, what was going on. And you figure out there's those two engines. Uh, there's hue, saturation, and lightness and hue, saturation, and brightness, and they are not compatible. I mean, they look the same under most circumstances, and then there's this, that one time that <laughs> they don't, and then you're confused, and then you wreck an image, or you spend time troubleshooting it. And let's face it, Photoshop more or less is an experience in troubleshooting. You know, you're, you're troubleshooting an image at the same time you're, you're troubleshooting Photoshop. Uh, so there are no rules with this curve, by the way. You're going to see me do some really ugly things to her and uh, try and not get as close as I am right now. So do as I say, not as I do, basically. But I'm I'm in kind of close here because I want to bring up some of these, but I shouldn't be. Like this this is one of those where you get into the weeds here and you're going to end up spending hours on every little nuance in her skin here, like I am now. Um, I need to back up. need to back up. There we go. Just got to back up on the edge of the cliff there. Now, my wife will watch me retouch her pictures, and which she doesn't do anymore, by the way. She's like, I can't watch you retouch my pictures. Uh, but it's that thing where you get up close and you start working on things, and she's like, yeah, I'm going to leave the room. I'm gonna, I'm just going to go anywhere else but here. <laughs> she doesn't want to see that happen. Actually, funny story. Uh, there's a picture of her wearing these skin-tight like leather pants that lace up the calves, and it's hanging behind the or I say opposite the makeup counter mirror in my studio. So if you take a selfie in the mirror, you're pretty much getting her picture in in your shot. And it's funny because that will pop up constantly on my image reverse search for it's like I'm always searching for images that have been taken because every week there's a whole new bunch of them. And it's funny is that butt picture of her shows up everywhere <laughs> because it's on that mirror or it's opposite the mirror. So it shows up. It's kind of funny. It's it's just one of those little quirky things. But yeah, she won't watch. She doesn't can't watch me or touch her skin. She's like, you know, I'm just gonna leave. Cause she looks amazing, and she's all like, yeah, I feel old. I feel a little old now. But that's you know, that's why people put makeup on. It's kind of like real life Photoshop, you know. I guess my wife does not wear makeup, so really, she she's kind of saying, well, this is what I am, and I see it now, and I'm just gonna leave the room. <laughs> So I'm just going through here again and, and looking for spots that are just kind of 
jumping out to my eye. And I'm not looking for every little tiny nuance. I'm not looking to fix everything about her. I'm trying to make it so that it looks natural. If I say, you know, every, if whatever marks are on her now, if they're gone in two weeks, then then we did a, we did a nice job. You know, so she, she say she had a pimple somewhere and I removed that. Well, that's fair. But if she has a mole or something and she may say, well, that was my, that was my favorite mole, you know, and then you removed it. You're going to feel like an idiot. So don't be overly aggressive with marks you remove. But like this just looks, it looks very natural to me. I don't see any areas that kind of jump out and uh, and greet me. Now, she has a lot of skin showing here, so this is going to take a bit, which is one of the other reasons I thought we'd talk about other stuff today because this is going to get very repetitive. And I'll have some jazz going in the background, but, you know, that's uh, that might be more of a distraction uh, for some people. But I just want to play something because it's... There's times when I don't want to talk, I'm just working. And I don't want to feel like you have to, I have to be constantly talking the entire time. But anyway, so this NFT thing, I think it's kind of a craze for the moment. Uh, it's it's everywhere. I mean, and if you haven't heard about it, you will soon hear about it, that's for sure. I'm actually writing an article for Shutter Magazine that'll be out in uh, next month's issue, I believe. So if you pick that up at Barnes & Noble, you can see some of the examples that I'm talking about and, and a little bit about the history of it. I won't go into the nitty-gritty of, of how it works, but I think for an article like that, it's almost uh, almost mandatory to talk a little bit about where it comes from because most people don't know. Like uh, we talk about mining, for example. Let's talk about mining because I can, I can mine on my machine, and I do from time to time if I'm not doing anything uh, that is very GPU-intensive. So basically my machine is just going to sit there and uses a miner called Claymore. And it's just an open source one. And uh, that uh, that will sit there and generate you know, 20 or 30 bucks a day in, in uh, Ethereum, which is what you use to mint your imagery. Uh, Robin asked me what uh, what I do when people steal my image. Well, I have a, um, I have a firm that, that will go and send them a threat letter. So basically... If your images are filed with the copyright office, which I do every 90 days, every 90 days there's a, an alarm uh, on my Google Calendar that says, hey, time to file your images. So you have to go back and find all the images you haven't filed within the last 90 days. And so I keep them in a folder of uh, works that have yet to be filed. And then I go to the copyright office, the US Copyright Office website, uh, which is really a travesty of development like I don't know who made that but um, they need to get a different job it was it's just it's so painful you know if you want to find a really great example of how to do something the government version is never the right answer right although I have to say I'm actually kind of impressed with the healthcare.gov website I think they did a really nice job on that one um, I used to be a software developer for a great many years so I'm going to consider myself qualified to make statements like that but the um, once you get it filed which is $55 for up to 750 images, uh, then you will basically watch for them to be stolen. And uh, so I have a service that I pay for that. And that service um, will then alert me when they see one. And now if the image is a legitimate uh, business that has stolen it and used it, I actually had a boudoir photographer in Houston steal one of my images for her boudoir business to advertise it. Uh, so probably not the brightest idea, uh, and it's actually one that appeared in Shutter Magazine as well, so that was kind of a fun, hey, you know. She can't really deny that she didn't find it somewhere because he could see where she took it. But anyway, so um, I sued her and basically sent... First of all, you, the process is very interesting. Uh, so what people normally do is they send a, a takedown notice, like, you know, hey, take that down, that's not yours. So basically you're saying to them, remove all of the evidence that you have stolen the image, is what you're telling them. Uh, so I don't send a a takedown notice at all uh, we let that stay there and while the lawyer is working on the case then it's obviously that it's up and available and people can see that yeah it's it's really there and get all the screenshots you need and, and what have you then they do is they send another letter and this is the letter that kind of uh kind of puts the whole ball rolling uh, because what's going to happen is as soon as they get it they're going to take it down right you know who would you oh no i don't know what you're talking about i didn't do that right uh, but by then, you know, the damage is done and we have all the evidence in the world. And what you want to do then is you want to say, um, basically, because you used it willfully, uh, the maximum fine allowed by the copyright law is $140,000 per 
per use. So it is a dumb number. And obviously you're not going to get that in most cases. Not to say you can't, because there are cases where that has, that has been done, and then, and then some. Uh, but the uh, typical threat is really uh, a real threat. I mean, it's not like a, hey, you know, we're going to sue you, you know, for this, this, and this. We can. Like, they did do it, and there's evidence that they did it. So now it's a matter of how much do they want to try and fight the fact that they didn't do it. Well, okay, there's a whole lot of evidence that says they did it. Uh, so then you say, okay, here's here's the deal. We'll let you off the hook um, for this, but you're gonna you're gonna pay a penalty, and we're gonna. It, I'd say it costs you. I'm just gonna say off the top of my head, it'll probably cost you forty thousand dollars to sue someone in federal court. So let's just say that, or to defend yourself in federal court, like to go to federal court, because all copyright is federal. So you have to play in the federal court. You can't do it in small claims. Although that is changing. Uh, due to what's called the Case Act, which is something that passed as part of the big um, first, uh, was one of the first bills that that Trump signed for the um, uh, uh, employment insurance or un unemployment uh, benefit checks that were signed. It was in there. And uh, so the Case Act passed. There's actually one senator or one congressman holding it up for years, just one guy, and he wouldn't budge and nobody really understood who was paying him off. But it was super suspicious to me. Like, why would you not let people do this? And uh, anyway, so I don't know what happened to him. He either got unelected or died or what have you. Hey, or changed his mind. Who knows? Anyway, so now we can sue people in small claims court, but that isn't really kind of rolled out yet. But what will happen is you'll send them a letter and you basically say, listen, you know, you, you violated this law and it's up to $140,000 and another $40,000 if you remove the watermark or branding. Like you notice that I put like a little tiny signature. I don't try and block your enjoyment of the image, but um, I do make it obvious where you got it. So if you say, hey, I wonder who did that. I love a picture like that. Uh, you can go and you can see clearly who did it. And that's the reason that I put that branding on there is so you can see who did it. Well, if you remove that because you're like, well, you know, I want to tell people this is mine, uh, then that is an additional like $40,000 penalty that gets tacked on to the end of your original assessment. So now it's getting to be quite an adventure uh, stealing one of these images and then removing the watermark. And now remember, this is in a corporate setting or a commercial setting. So you're making money from the image. I'll give you a really good example that's a true example that I'm actually still litigating, but I, I will leave some details out. Let's say that you had a website or you have an image and someone's running a Facebook thing called Which of the Seven Dwarves Are You, right? So you fill out this goofy test where you give them way more information than you probably should because you're playing a game and you're not thinking about what you're doing because <laughs> that happens. And, uh, and then what happens is they go to one of the pictures of the dwarves and let's say this is a, a picture you made. And they're using that as the, you know, hey, you're you're sleepy, you know, congratulations, and you know, thanks for all the information you gave us. So now you are the sleepy dwarf, and they say, hey, share this on Facebook. So you share it on Facebook, and now all of a sudden it's it's all over the place, and everybody else wants to see, well, what dwarf am I? That's terribly interesting. Well, every time they do that, every time you land on that page, there's advertising being sold on that page, and the advertising revenue from these is is a large amount, I and mean, you're talking millions of dollars uh, potentially. You know, maybe even you know, hundreds of millions. It really depends on what the what the quiz is and how popular it is and, and all these things. So uh, you get no benefit from them using your picture because you know you wanted to be you know, they're using your, your picture at the end, but they are certainly making money on it because that is getting shared and it's all over the place. Well, so someone did that with one of my images, and I'm not gonna say what the contest was or anything like that, but. Uh, that they got a surprise letter from the, the lawyer who said, hey, you know, you've obviously been using this and you're making money off of it and uh, you're not using it with license permission. So uh, we're going to start the bidding at... Um, sorry, we're going to start the bidding at um, $60,000 and uh, you can settle out of court, which is uh, which is a nice thing because that it saves them forty grand that they would have to even go to federal court, and they're going to lose. Remember, they are guilty. Like they know they did it. It wasn't like, oops, I slipped and fell and use your slipped and fell and use your image. They they know they did it. Uh, so now they're like, well, how do I how do I get out of this pickle? Well, they're not. So then they typically come back and say, listen, that's an outrageous sum. And we haven't made that much money off this, you know, and our, 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 all our grandmas have, uh, have died recently and, and you know, we, we don't have any money, blah, blah, blah. 
And you just say, okay, what's what are you going to bid back? So they'll say, oh, we know we'll give you three hundred dollars or something. Say, well, no, let's uh, let's go and say maybe maybe forty thousand, and we'll, we'll call it good there. And that's that's how that works. So that person would then come back and say, well, um, I guess that's I guess that's what we have to pay because that's your only choice. And um, that's how the stuff gets started then the lawyer would send them a drafting a draft letter of this is the what you agreed to we'll drop the charges and uh you can go on your merry way uh, but um you're gonna pay this amount and that's what that's what they do so it works out pretty well um now they only take cases of the things they can win obviously because it's a waste of time if they're gonna sue somebody and then you can't get the money from it uh, so we always let them kind of determine what they want to do and, and what isn't going to work but for the most part, it's uh, it works pretty well to just let them do their thing. Just adding a bit of a catch light here because I don't have one. I'll we'll see how if I can make that look good or not. So filter, blur that thing. No, it looks terrible because it's underlit, right? Let's move it. Let's move it up top here. That's closer. Sorry, I shouldn't. I should have like put another light on here to kind of toss it up into our eyes, but I didn't. So there's that. Now I have to be with that. Yeah, I don't like that. That looks horrible. So let's change it to this. I might just leave it out. I can't find a way that I like it. But you know it's worth trying. It's because her lids are so low. But she's still beautiful, so I'm not going to care. But, and this is the last step for the skin here. This is where we just kind of go through and add any contouring. Because you notice we took out uh, some of the whatever was happening here with the skin next to this um, settee or chaise lounge or whatever we'll call it today. I fixed that, but I may have removed some of the contouring of her. So I'm just going to go and put it back in. So this is just a gray layer set to overlay, and I'm just going to add a little bit of light where it's already light. Okay, here. So I just use X to switch between black and white. So black would obviously you know, darken an area, and X, uh, white, would obviously lighten an area. That's all I'm really doing. Just kind of going through and making decisions on what I want, contour-wise. And I'm not uh, not a makeup artist, and this is why you have a makeup artist, because they would make these decisions at the time of the shoot. And uh, she did have a makeup artist that day, and I think they did a fabulous job. But it's some of that surrealist feel to my images that I enjoy, and that's one of the reasons, you, one of the ways you get it is by going back and, and doing this little step adds just that little bit of hmm, what's going on there. I I like it, but I don't understand what I'm seeing. And I like it on the lip, too. Look at that on the lip. Isn't that amazing? So you can kind of see the effect I've done here. And it just looks like this. It's, oops. This is all I've done. It's uh, in a very big brush, and it took me you know, seconds to do it. And this is aggressive, by the way. I mean, I'm, I'm because I'm talking and doing it as I'm doing it, but I don't mind that a bit because I think, again, it's, it's interesting. And it adds that little bit of what is going on here? I don't know, but I enjoy this. And uh, same with all the fingers. Like, just put a little bit down, a little highlight down the fingers, and maybe a little shadow between them. It's a little more interesting contrast. Uh, she's just so beautiful. She was a, a really nice find. My friend James sent her to me, and uh, she's just been a real doll to work with. So we're going to bring her back into the studio this Saturday, or this Sunday, I should say. So if you're ever in Milwaukee and you want to come to one of these events, uh, I do post them publicly, but they sell out pretty much the same day. Uh, but they're uh, well attended. We always have wonderful models. And by the way, always women. Like, you know, I don't really shoot guys. I mean, I do shoot high school senior photos of boys, but um, if I'm going to shoot a personal project, it's going to be uh, a beautiful woman. So it's just, hey, it's my life and what I want to do with it. <laughs> this is what I want to shoot. 
going to, just adding a little bit of contour here and there. In some cases, a bit more than I probably need to, but oh well. So it just adds a little bit of additional something some to the image to kind of make it uh, pop. Not that she needs it. Okay. And that's the, that's what we did there. So you can see the before and after. And here's that, here's what that image or that looks like. Almost looks like a oil painting or not oil painting, a uh, watercolor. So something like this is uh, where I would go with it. Now we have, we have some things we need to do to fix this image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, stamp visible the whole thing so that's control alt shift e or control command option shift e or i don't even know it's a mac thing i don't do mac so this is a distraction down here so i'm just going to use this this uh shift backspace it brings up the fill dialog or option backspace i think it's a mac because again it's a mac so they can't do everything the way we do it they gotta do it the hard way and this mark here i'm just going to move this whole thing the shift backspace method works really well for almost all these goofy little marks that we're going to find like this. Like, And I would use the patch tool as well. I love the patch tool. Patch tool is my friend. The patch tool, think of it like a texture replacer. If you take something and you replace it with another texture, it won't replace the color. It'll replace the texture. Uh, now it will try and like, well, I'm going to say borrow the color or transition the color from one thing to another but it is a really powerful mechanism for getting rid of things like this because I can just borrow the texture. Like, if, oh, I want a softer texture. I'll just go over here. Like this blue, you'll notice it's kind of taking the blue out, but it's also trying to work it in. It's it's creating this, this uh, combination of the two things. I just want to get rid of some of this stain in here. I'm gonna use a clone stamp for this. The trick with the clone stamp here is to make sure that the hardness of the clone stamp, you see how it's too hard? I need to make it kind of feel like it's the same as her skin. So this is closer. So now as I clone stamp in this, it won't look like it's that obvious that there's a, a different uh, thing going on. So it's the blur of the clone stamp if I need even a little bit softer that makes the, the clone stamp look believable. And I worry about this mess here because again, we have our patch tool. So we we'll just go and grab the patch tool and then pop that on. So that's all good. Easy peasy. And then I can look for little distractions too, like this. There's a line here that I, my eye is drawn to. Look at this mark here. This is a big sheet of steel that's hanging in the studio. It was originally over the wall, the windows, uh, because my studio used to hold road salt. And uh, the, the salt was all the way to the ceiling and it would have broken the windows out. Uh, so they left that uh, that in place. And here's a hard transition here that I don't really like. So I'm just going to borrow some of this over here so that it, again, all I did was, was highlight this. And borrow from over here and it's going to try and merge those two colors and textures together and now it's not this visual line anymore so use this i love this tool it's probably one of the most understated tools in photoshop all right i'm going to hit save so here's what we did so far if you're watching at home or from your office you've snuck out for lunch as robin has and we're just watching this uh, one more thing I might want to do is I might want to try and fix some of this in here um, because it is pushed down from the tightness of her, her outfit, but I'm not going to. Um, she is she's not a thin girl, and I think she is perfectly curvy. Like just, I mean, she has got everything going for her, and this this outfit's a little tight on her because of the way she's laying, and I don't mind that. I think it actually kind of hints that she's soft and feminine. So I. I really enjoy the the whole the whole, all of her. She's just really nice. Uh, so I'm going to leave that alone. But if you wanted to, this would be the time you would do that. Um, you tip you could do it before or after. So here's your here's your train of thought. Do you a do the liquefaction first and then find out the client hates it and have to go back and reliquify her, or do you b get the skin done then liquefy her because it's a lot easier to fix later. So to me, I kind of prefer to do it at the later stage. So I'm going to do control J to copy that and I can show you what I do. I just do control X and that will bring up the liquify panel. And uh, then you just go in and scooch stuff around. So if you want to do this, I typically don't push in. I would pull out. So uh, I would pull out because if you push it in, I think that tends to make people think, well, you just made her look skinny. Well, no. The intention was to make it so that so that the it didn't push into her right so this 
But that doesn't that look kind of weird to me. Like, yeah, well, it should dip in, right? It, 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 it is against her skin. So, yeah, not how I would do this. So um, I would typically not do it. One area you could do it, and one area I actually do it quite often is on the hair. Like, I'll add more body to the hair because everybody's always like, well, I wish my hair had more body. Well, okay. And I'm bald, so I say that more than you do. But there you go. So get, get rid of that. Um, I do see a bright spot here I need to knock down. Just kind of looking at the image from, again, this far out. Another trick is to do uh, Control H, which will flip the image horizontally. And that was added not too long ago, by the way. So it's right here. You used to have to actually flip the canvas uh, horizontal. So it was uh, up here, canvas rotation, flip canvas horizontal. This actually flips the whole canvas, the real canvas. The Control H is only flipping the view. And what that allows you to do is suddenly other marks uh, or things that you didn't see before would then pop out. It's like, okay, I'm gonna grab my, my clone stamp and I see a couple of marks here that I should have fixed the first time. Oops, let me turn this off. Uh, but I didn't, I missed. Uh, so this is a really, really cool trick for going back and letting your eyes kind of be refreshed. But, uh, here nor there. And we did, did we do anything in this area? Yeah, we got rid of that back. That, that crack. And what you can do too is, is like we're getting in, we're one, we're a little over one gig, which is not horrible. If this were an overly large image, we could actually go back and say, what areas do we only need to keep and not keep the whole darn thing? But, um, the reason I say that is because if I wanted to make those changes on her skin, I'd have to either refrequency separate the whole thing or make holes in this. And then it gets complicated as to what layer you're on and what you're working with. So I'm just going to turn this back off. But that is a really cool tool. Uh, plus, it gives you an option to say, hmm, does, uh, does this look better one way or the other? So I'm going to hit save because um, I think um, I think this is good. So I'm going to go. Uh, we can color. We can color grade in here, too, by the way. Let me talk about a little bit about that. I'm gonna put the Wacom tablet away though and grab my mouse. I, I love my Wacom tablet. I could not retouch without it. But at a certain point, put it away. I put it away when I'm not, when I don't need to draw. I need to select things with my mouse and click on things. Then I use my mouse because it's, it's just as, I think it's actually faster than Wacom because going up and doing file, edit, copy, you know, do something else, just it's just slow. But if you're sketching or drawing for retouching skin, it is a daydream. It's just it's just a dream to work with. So uh, if you don't have one, I highly recommend it, especially if you do a lot of skin. All right, so what I want to do now is um, I want to play with color grading it. One of the cool things that I don't really talk about on this channel because I don't really color grade with presets is the color lookup. Uh, so this uses a lot or a lookup table. And what's cool about lookup tables is they work in almost every piece of software. So you can use the same lookup table across you know, Premiere or Photoshop or um, most things, except for Capture One. It doesn't use lots. So everyone else does except for Capture One. So what sometimes I'll do is I'll just go through, and I have a few favorites that I really enjoy, but like Candlelight, I love this one. It looked horrible in this image, but I do I do love it. Uh, Drop Blues is another one I really like. We're coming to that one here pretty soon. Um, there's Drop Blues. Again, doesn't work with this image very well. But uh, sometimes this is a really great way to kind of go through and say, mm, I'm looking for ideas. This Foggy Foggy Night's another one I really like. And this image, it's uh, it's better than the others, but it's still kind of ter terrible. Um, but sometimes this is a nice way to kind of go and say, well, I'm looking for something different, but I really don't know what that is. Uh, this is a nice place to get it. Um, so I thought I'd mention that. Another one I really like is just the curve, just a standard old curve, but you can use it by color. So I used to play in the green and the blue one here. So if you pull down, you're, you're adding yellow. If you push up, you're adding blue. Uh, so what's interesting is you could say add yellow or blue in the shadows, for example, and then add yellow in the highlights. So you can come up with these really interesting twists on things like, hmm, this is actually kind of interesting. Isn't it? Hmm. And of course, then you could lower the opacity of this effect because it is, again, a curve on its own layer. And you can do the same thing for the other channels. Um, if you want to add a little more cyan in the shadows, for example, and a little more red uh, above. It's just neat. Uh, also, most people don't know this, but if you click on auto, um, it will give you like this effect. So if we go and look at the RGB, we can see it did something. It and it did something different to each one of these channels. Um, or it could, but it doesn't. Uh, and if you hold on alt and click on auto, it will bring up what it's doing. And this is really one of those really cool little trips of Photoshop I don't think a lot of people know. But I love some of these other settings are more interesting, like this one and the uh, fine light and dark colors. And it'll do is it'll tone each channel, but look at how drastic each one is. 
Uh, you can enchant, enhance the contrast per channel and then uh, the monochromatic contrast. So more or less the uh, kind of the neutral. But you can you can snap the neutrals here for like some of these are, are really kind of cool. So and again, another way to color grade an image that uh, isn't exactly obvious, but is around. So I'm going to get rid of that as well. We're going to go back to this and we're going to go ahead and I believe we already saved this. We'll hit save again. We're going to go back to capture one and we'll color grade this in there uh, quickly and we'll, uh, we'll be done. So in here, uh, by the way, if you if you stuck with me so far and you like what you see, click the like button. I would appreciate that greatly. Uh, sometimes people just forget. They're like sitting there and oh, yeah, here's that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back. I'm going to reevaluate some of these mis some of these mistakes. Some of these some of these uh, uh, things that I made. Now, I do have a nude in here, so I got to be careful. Um, I to I need to show the output folder, which is where the Photoshop documents all live. And uh, oh, I guess I removed it like a smart guy. This was a fun one. If you didn't watch this video from week before last, I think uh, we made this one. Uh, this one was a, a private one I did. So now we're on our TIFF and we can go back and we can look at our exposure, but we can't really play with this. This doesn't work the same way anymore. It's kind of like it, it makes things muddy. Don't don't play with this. You've already made your decisions with this before you went to Photoshop. Uh, contrast, maybe a little contrast. Now, I'm not afraid to go this way with contrast, by the way. Sometimes contrast in the negative way is uh, in more interesting to me, especially for boudoir images. It kind of adds a softness to it. Uh, but I'm not going to I'm not gonna make a decision until I wiggle a little bit and decide which way I like. And I'm looking at the image when I move the slider, not at the slider. I don't care what the value is over here, but I'll just wiggle back and forth until it seems like it's right where it needs to be. And that's how I do that with pretty much every one of these. Now, brightness uh, is really your your exposure control now. So if you want this a little dark and moody, you would bring this down a bit. And um, that's how you control that. If you want a more light and airy, you do this. It really can't overexpose your image now because it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it's kind of more the middle of your graph. It doesn't affect this upper part too much. So you can really yank on this and it'll still stay properly exposed. So again, I'm just going to find where I like the exposure. I don't really care what the value is, just looking at it. Saturation, I don't really ever play with this slider, in truth, um, unless it's to take it down. But um, I like the warmth of this image. In fact, we'll probably push that a little further in a second. And then uh, some of these sliders are broken, like the black slider right now is, is uh, oh, it's actually working. Uh, sometimes it's very broken. Now we would have made most of our decisions with the black slider before we went to Photoshop, but if you want to do any nuances, you could do that. Um, the white slider is, um, yeah, why would you do that to yourself? And I don't do, don't do this either. This, this tends to, again, take a lot of the life out of the image. The highlight slider actually, um, I use this way sometimes to push more life back into it. And then shadow. Uh, this tends to really flatten images and make, introduce a lot of warmth, um, undesirably, I think, into the shadows. So here's another way to do the highlights. Like I like kind of like the highlight that was on her face there. In fact, if we take this exposure or take this brightness down a bit. Let's play with that. Let's take a filled adjustment layer. So I just click and hold and then do filled adjustment layer. And then we're going to click on the luma range. And I want to do is I want to feature only her face. So I'm just going to grab the display mask, push this all the way against this edge and bring this over here until we, this is the feather. I'm on a feathering, something like, uh, something like this maybe. Like apply and now anything we do to that is affect only that that area so we can go in here we can add brightness and it's adding it only to those areas so if we want to say add a little more punch to her we can do that here so it's kind of the equivalent of going and using a contrast slider in in some ways because that's kind of what contrast does but um, this is just a little more specific plus again it's a mask so again we hit m for mask we can see it and if we don't like it in some places, we can use the eraser tool and go in and say, well, you know, I like this just a little too bright in here. Um, we can say we've erased just the mask in that area. So as we brighten this, it's not brightening her forehead anymore. Something like this, I think, is, is interesting. Make sure you blow anything out. So I'm going to click exposure warning just to make sure that nothing starts turning red on me, um, which probably it won't happen because again these are these are not overly aggressive settings but um, there's a few that are interesting in there. one other thing I like to do quite a bit is I like to take the shadows I had to click back in the background layer by the way because you don't want to do your adjustments on here you want to uh, do you want to do most of them not on that that specific layer because it's such a small mask is I like to raise the gray layer or the black point of the image up just 
I like this for boudoir a lot. In fact, I have a preset called No True Black, and so here at the top, and all it does is it just does that one dumb thing. It doesn't do anything else. Um, and then what I do is I take the middle point and pull it back down again. So it's kind of a, it adds this almost powdery finish to the um, to the image, which I appreciate. And then we'll go here, and now let's start actual color grading this. So the shadow again. I'm gonna I'm gonna go wildly out and all the way around, and I'm just gonna look for what mood the image wants. So you're going to find that you really love one part of this circle. And I go all the way around, even though I know I'm probably going to end up right over in here, I still want to go all the way around. So I'm just kind of looking for what works. And then once I get the kind of the color, I'm going to kind of work in smaller and smaller circles. Again, looking at the image, not at the slider. I don't care where the slider is. I just want the picture until I find something I like. So that's about, about where I like it, apparently. And then you can look at this as kind of like your volume knob. Are you sure you want it that bright? You want a little less? Maybe something more nuanced like that. Do the same thing in mid-tone. Mid-tone is almost always opposite the shadow for some dumb reason. Call that color theory for the poor, poor man here. Uh, this is more or less her skin tone. So she just has this beautiful skin tone. And I don't want to rob that by kind of desaturating her a bit with the blue that I put into the shadow. So I'm going to counter that a bit with this. A highlight I typically don't play with. Um, but again, uh, if we felt that we've kind of taken some of that away from her, we can go up and turn it all the way up, by the way, and then find the right color. Like, is this too red? This is too yellow. Find the color that's the healthy her. And then once you've got it, then again, you can take the volume bob down and say, well, I just want to shove a little bit of this. By the way, this will stop you from blowing out uh, any of those areas that seem like they were uh, exposure highlighting by adding in a color to those areas. They're not going to blow out. Uh, in the white channel, which is a thing that you notice if you print something, you'll end up where areas where the print ink stops applying to the paper and you get a line. Um, so you always want ink everywhere across the paper. So even if it's just a little bit of yellow, which is what we effectively did right here, that will solve that. Now the master is the overall feel for the image. So um, again, if we want it a little warmer, which I think would work, but again, I want to go all the way around. I did a Maleficent image I did. I ended up doing a sepia version, and I was torn as to which one I loved. Like, it, it looks okay over here, but it's really pulling away from her amazing skin color. I think she said she's Hispanic and Egyptian is her, her mix. Just beautiful. Can't wait to shoot her again. She's a really lovely lady. And inside as well. She's, like, got a great personality, so it's not just, like, oh, she's fun to look at. She's actually a beautiful, beautiful woman inside now. All right, so I'm going to add a new a empty adjustment layer here, and I'm just going to draw a line, um, kind of like a, something like this. And I just want to bring up this a little bit, and I'm going to do probably just the shadow side of this, just to kind of make it a little more even tone across the board, something like this. So if we do our Y for our before and after, this is the effect our color grading can. So it's subtle, but I think it added that extra little bit of, of uh, powder. Powder. That's what I'm looking for. Um, before and after that extra bit of finish. That's where it'll finish, finish to the image. So there's your before and after. Now, obviously, if we go all the way back to what we had at the beginning, it's a, it's a much more substantial change. Let's do that, 1136. Let's do our browser, and we can do 1136. All images. So that's our before and after. So if I hold down your shift key, you can move both windows simultaneously, um, or at least initially. So I retouch the skin. And again, any marks that are hers that are going to be there in two weeks are, are left. And anything that is uh, just a momentary you know, acne, whatever, that should not stay on her, in my opinion. So the rest of this was all uh, cleaned up and, and uh, fixed. Again, minor, minor adjustments so that it was very easy to do. But there you go. That's our our little image for today. So I thought I'd just talk about a random thing today. So I hope you enjoyed the talk about the non-fungible tokens, the NFTs. And if you have any questions about that stuff, throw them below. But there's a, a lot there to be learned. And uh, will it blow over in a few a few months? I'm not sure. Uh, but while it's there, I think it's, a, it's an interesting revenue source to add to some things. I've, I've heard of a, a couple of wedding photographers now that have actually started adding... Um, NFTs to some of their stuff. So uh, who's to say it will be a an ongoing thing because it is expensive and the perceived 
image is exactly the same as every other image. So I think it's going to be a harder sell. But um, nonetheless, it's uh, very interesting. So everybody, have a, a great week. I'm uh, back from Atlanta now, so I'll be uh, around. I got some other videos I'm going to be doing here. I have your texture of the month for everyone who's joined the channel. And thank you so much again for your channel support. You guys are the world to this channel. I mean, I couldn't do it without you. Um, all Everyone's getting a free texture again this month, and you get access to all the previous free textures. So there's a lot of them in there. And then there'll be a Capture One uh, uh, preset that will be coming out for you for the uh, Patreon level and higher. I've started doing that, I, uh, I think it was last month or month before last. And again, you get access to all the previous ones. Uh, so it's uh, it's worth the uh, price of a Starbucks coffee to come in and grab all those textures and to support the channel uh, for $5. So everybody take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you all next time.